Uh, welcome again to uh, today's uh, live stream. Uh, this is quite an impromptu session. Uh, uh, yeah, hi, I'm Terry here. I'm, um, I'm Terry Shira, who runs DOC, the guy who's operating the video. Uh, now I have a helper who's helping me to operate, so that's why I'm here. Uh, and here, here I have with me is a renowned human rights lawyer, and Ravi, uh, who is, gonna, is here today to explain to us about the constitutional challenge uh, that was fought earlier prior to the nomination uh, on voting rights, if I'm not wrong? Yes. And yeah, so, so he'll be here sharing the, the, uh, the background of uh, why the application was brought about, what kind of uh, argument did the Attorney General uh, fought against your application, and what was the judgment uh, given by the High Court and for subsequently the Court of Appeal. Um, mm -hmm. So, uh, Without further ado, uh, can Mr. Murphy, uh, <laughs> sure, share, sure, share, sure. Just, 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 yeah. just share it because I think mm. for for a lot of the uh, uh, viewers yeah. and those people who are uh, who who are aware of the constitutional challenge, but the thing is they are not sure what was the challenge about. We, we all know, like well, all of us, we we know that uh, certain rights are enshrined in the constitution. Right. Uh, some would say that it, vote the right to vote is is part of it. Uh, is part of our constitutional right. Uh, of course, I think prior to this application was that not, not that firm, isn't it? Yeah. So what has what happened uh, basically is that um, my client took this position that holding these elections during this pandemic would result in a an election which is not free and fair. And the notion of the right to vote. Nobody is saying that my client was not was denied the right to vote. Mm. But what is the meaning of the right to vote? Right to vote, the meaning of vote is a process, it's an election process, it's an electoral process. That process must be free and fair. Given the pandemic measures and, and so on and so forth, which I will highlight later, formed the basic ground for my client to launch this application that these elections are not free and fair. Therefore, his right to vote to have a, a, an election which is constitutionally valid as free and fair. Um, so that was what he was challenging and he was um, attempting to prohibit the returning officer from conducting the elections. That's the first part of the application, application. yes. The second part of the application which is, which, is, um, uh, which is important or equally more important to all Singaporeans uh, because we do understand the difficulty of this prohibitory order, but at the same time, there's another important issue, because uh, which which relates to the question of the right to vote. Hmm. Basically, do we have a right to vote in Singapore? If you ask, you will think that yes, okay, the law says there's a right to vote, but is it a constitutionally protected right? This issue was not clear, and because of the case of uh, John Tan, Mr. John Tan, with whom I'm represented, who is the chairman of the Singapore Democratic Party, because of a recent case whereby he was prohibited from so standing for elections, election, and, and yes. the court ruled, and so on and so forth, because of his uh, certain matters that was before the court. So the court ruled in that in John Tan's case, yes. where I happen to represent him, that the right to vote is not a constitutional right. Uh, sorry, the right to vote is not, to, to use the precise language, the right to vote is not a fundamental right. Was well, not defined before this, I suppose? The court said yes. that, the court in John Tan's case, case yeah. said that they referred to previous case of Velama, which is a by-elections case, yes. to say that the court of appeal in Velama's case did not say that the right to vote is a fundamental right. Therefore, it begs the question, if the right to vote is not a fundamental right, what right is that? The meaning of the word fundamental right means something which is so, so fundamental to the structure of the constitution that if you take that right out, that's, that disturbs the entire the organic formation of the body of the constitution. Okay. So, yeah. Okay, maybe I think it's, it's a bit dragging yeah. a bit too, too much. Right? Yeah. Okay. For the average viewer, could you summarize this whole application like in, within like two, three paragraphs? Like, okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay, basically the question is that the High Court ruled that in, in the previous case that, that right to vote is not a fundamental right. So therefore there's a question as to whether Singaporeans have actually a constitutionally protected valid constitutional right to vote. Okay. That's, yeah, that's basically the second question that we, ha we, we, we addressed in court. Yes. 
And in relation to the first issue as to what are the issues which in relation to uh, free and fair election, what were the breaches of free and fair elections, we highlighted to the court that um, the Parliamentary Elections COVID-19 Special Arrangements Act um, contained certain measures. We highlighted several measures as to why it breaches free and fair elections and including the issue of unlevel playing field that social distancing conditions have resulted in, the rights of overseas voters um, and also those who face quarantine orders and stay orders. So several of these issues which are connected to the pandemic situation affect the right to free and fair elections. Um, the, yeah. So that was the premises in which your client submitted the application? Yes. Yes. Uh, so what, what was the counter argument that was filed uh, by the Attorney General? Um, basically, the Attorney Generals um, have said that um, they say that that um, basically the writ of election has been uh, issued mm -hmm. and therefore the returning officer essentially does not have the power to stop the election. He has to, he's mandated by, he shall hold the election within three months. In fact, as it stands, he has the power to hold it up to three, I mean, he has the discretion I to see, hold it, uh, yeah. He, he had three the, months meaning from the time, yeah. Uh, so he has the discretion, discretion. Of, uh, uh, of when to hold the election. Election, yes. When, at the point when the read of election is being issued. Yes. So meaning like... Uh, to be precise, 56 uh, days. 56 days? Yes. Oh, okay. So it, that means that it is, there doesn't seem to be the need to actually hold it so urgently. Yes, yeah. exactly. Yeah. So we are saying that basically um, whether, I mean, first of all, the six months is one issue as to whether it should be held later because parliament can be automatically dissolved yeah. at a certain period of time, that is um, uh, January, and then there is sufficient time spent in, since the situation is improving, you know, so therefore there should be greater uh, arrangements towards level playing field and citizens should be more allowed to properly vote and overseas voters should be given the right to vote given the fact that there are more, more than 200,000 voters uh, around the world. And we were shocked to find out during our research that half the voters, overseas voters, about 100,000 of them who are in Malaysia don't even have a polling facility to vote. So therefore, they may form, maybe I don't have the perfect statistics, mm. maybe 2 or 3% of the voters, they are completely in disenfranchised if they don't have a polling facility to vote. And given the fact that the pandemic situation also does not allow people to travel so freely and there are restrictions, this affects the right to vote. So substantial population, 2 or 3%, even in a country like Malaysia, they are disenfranchised. So collectively, when you look at all these measures, there is a reasonable argument to make that the elections are not free and fair, and therefore, even though I exercise my right to vote, it is not exercised in a free and fair manner, and therefore, it is unconstitutional. This holding of these elections in this manner. So, on top of the, uh, on top of uh, the AGC saying that, oh, right. since the real of election has been issued, and therefore, elections should be held. Is there any other compelling reasons why? Uh, they should, uh, they find that your application should... Yes, I mean, uh, the AGC also have countered several arguments. I mean, one of the things that they raised is that my client can have the right to vote. I mean, the, these are all overseas voters he's citing and stuff like that. And then, um, so it, he's not personally uh, affected and therefore, and, 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 and for example, opposition, um, for example, opposition MPs, uh, if they face this, I mean, not opposition candidates, if they face such um, problems, then they should be, you know, launching this application. So where he's standing, as far as his standing is concerned, he's like something like, you know, so, so yeah. Can, can I say that he's not personally? He, a, he, he's not. Contest, they are not con really contesting that that uh, his uh, that there is an issue with the overseas voters not able to come back to vote. But more of the person who's appealing for uh, filing this application is not personally affected. Can I say that? Um, not only that point, the AGC is also saying that, in fact, um, I may want to also cross one stage further by saying that the court, even the Court of Appeal, said that basically where is actually in the Parliamentary Elections Act does it basically say that the government has to provide a facility to all overseas voters in Singapore? For all overseas Singapore what, voters, so that you, you can, in fact, to begin with, you so you first of all you got to cross that before you then can say that there's a free and fair. Right, before we yeah. go into the yeah. uh, so-called uh, uh, the the the, uh, the the points of 
your argument. Yeah. Right? Let's talk about the judgment that was made because this this case is yes. all over. Yeah. So what was the high court judgment? I mean, before the court of appeal. Yes. Before yes. The yes. Appeal, yes. As 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 you know that. Uh, <coughs> so, okay. So let's put the chronology. You you when did they file the uh, ch uh, challenge? The the application was filed. Um, uh, before the no uh, two, two days before the nomination, few days day. of the nomination, yeah. and it was heard on the day. The day it was no, it was filed on the day when the uh, parliament the was dissolved. Oh, okay. Parliament was dissolved so and the writ was issued. issued. In the same evening, we filed. Okay. So that we do not delay matters, and subsequently we were given a hearing date on the on the on the eve of the nomination day, which was an urgent hearing date. Mm. And we were very grateful to the court that they fixed the date before the nomination day, and the. And the Attorney General countered and said that it should be, after, there shouldn't be much of a prejudice that, uh, that, that, that this uh, hearing could take place even after the nomination day. So the court took, um, uh, you know, uh, an approach that um, the registrar fixed the matter on the 29th, which is on the eve of the nomination day. The High Court heard the matter and they dismissed the matter and they said that, you know, there, there are no grounds to prohibit the returning officer from holding the election, I mean, uh, from, yeah prohibit him from holding the elections. And following that, you, you filed the uh, appeal? I filed an emergency appeal to the um, Court of Appeal um, um, on the same day, and the Court of Appeal uh, obliged to and convened the hearing on the, nomin on the morning of the nomination day itself. Ah. So, so that was really expedited. There's no point of pro problem with the mic. Eh? Uh, no, no problem. <laughs> okay, I, okay. I, I, there was some yeah. complaining about the mic. <laughs> okay, yeah. okay, yeah. 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 Mm. Sorry, when, uh, so, yeah, so, Court of Appeal. Yeah, Court of Appeal. So it was just within one day, isn't it? Yes. Tw yeah, on the eve of uh, the nomination day was High Court. Our application was dismissed. Court of Appeal next uh, morning at um, early morning, 9.30, they convened. Okay. Uh, let me think about that. So what was, the, okay, so just now you talk, talk about the uh, judgment from the High Court. Then mm. what did the Court of Appeal rule? Mm, the Court of Appeal essentially ruled uh, mm. that, first of all, we are not able to really identify uh, the constitutional basis for a free and fair elections. Mm -hmm. The Court of Appeal said that, yes, we recognize that free and fair elections is a principle, mm. but then we, are not, we could not specifically locate the constitutional framework for a free and fair elections. Okay. Uh, so I, uh, in response, was my argument essentially that the right to vote encompasses free and fair elections, you know, and then you can't actually extricate that and that's where I located it. The problem is that we don't have uh, a rich jurisprudence on what is free and fair elections, like for example in India. Mm. This kind of issues, because India has an elections commission, independent elections commission, and our constitution is quite similar to the Indian constitution and also Malaysian constitution because of the, so there are a lot of definitions of what is free and fair elections, whether the constitution does have a right to free and fair elections. So, so it, is, it was not, it was not it were exactly clear when you say, when the, when, the, when the court said that yes, it's a matter of principle, but w whether it is constitutionally protected, but from the whole discourse and the judgment, it appears that that the right to vote does contain the principle of free and fair elections and therefore the right to vote and the right to free and fair elections is a const at least the right to vote is a constitutional right. Okay, I think put it in a very okay. lame yes, yes, put yes. in a very lame I'm manner. sorry because oh, this yeah, is yeah. Yeah. put in a very yeah. layman manner. Drink in the in the judgment from from the judgment of the Call of Appeal, did they actually really define uh, that it is a constitutional right for a person as a, uh, is voting a constitutional right? The right to vote. The Court of Appeal yes. said that that the right to vote, I mean they are prepared to accept that the right to vote is a constitutional right. Okay. That it is plainly a constitution it is it is plainly a constitutional right. Has it I ever say. been defined in such a manner? No. No, I in, in in so far as the judgments that I've read, I mean mm. it is not clear that um, the it is it is a const it is it is a constitutional right. Uh, whether it's a right that is, when we say constitutional right, constitutional right, we must be very specific. Like for example, um, I'm sorry, I have to use this word fundamental right. Fun mm. we, have a, we have in the constitution fundamental liberties, yep. right equality, um, you know, right, you know, right to equality, right to life, freedom of expression, all these are fundamental liberties. If you say right to vote, then right to vote also becomes part of the fundamental right. 
So that was where we are coming from, which means parliament cannot take away that right. And I was asking the court to rule it as a fundamental right because parliament cannot take away that right. But the court did not go on that track. But they said that it is, we will declare, it, we, we are prepared we, that they, to the extent that they, the, the extent they went to say that it is a constitutional right. And they defined what is that constitutional right. That means it is in accordance with the supremacy clause of the constitution. That means constitutional supreme, any law which is being passed by parliament is against that constitutional right, then the court will intervene. So therefore, it is uh, to that extent, I will say that it's a constitutional right that cannot be taken away from parliament. And therefore, we uh, more or less, um, you know, there was a consensus on that. Yes. So let's say if your client, because currently your client can, uh, can go to the polling booth and, 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 and vote. If your client was a Singaporean who is based overseas and has no access to a polling booth and have no means of returning, would this application have gone through? Well, that, that, that same question then will come as to whether, there are two things. Mm -hmm. One is, uh, of course, his right to vote is violated. It's much clearer to to illustrate that. Just because of that. the yes. pandemic happening, yes, yes. all this restriction. But, but, but the yeah. thing is that, but, but the, the position of the Attorney General is that, you know, in Malaysia, even previously, I, I, from what I understand is that the polling facilities were not provided for Malaysians. I mean, Singaporeans living in Malaysia. Uh, no, no, no. See, the, the thing here is, yeah. right, yes, polling facilities are not being provided to Malaysians. In fact, for many countries yeah. uh, all, all around the world, exactly. we, we only have 10, 10 polling booths uh, across the whole uh, globe. Uh, but but the thing is, in this pandemic, yeah. because of the, all the travel restrictions, so there are some certain people who are uh, who are, who are land, uh, land bounded into their states. Yes. So take take for Australia for example. Yeah. There, in Australia, there's only one polling booth, so people from different states across Australia will find uh, probably impossible for them to even if they wanted to vote, they couldn't actually cross the states to to reach the polling booth. And so in uh, and in Malaysia's case. In the past general election, yes, you have no polling booth being prepared for them because it's easy for them either take yes, a flight yes, no. yes. or take a land transport. But yes. in this case, because of the uh, the border con yes, control, yes. even if they want to, yes. they, they have no means of returning. So would this actually make any difference? Okay, I, I would like to just respond to one point. Yes. That, and, and then, I, of course, then I will respond to your question. Is that when we talk about Malaysia in particular, when half of these overseas voters, mm. as I said, about 100,000 mm. is based in Malaysia, Malaysia yeah, yeah. and they, 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 it's a lockdown situation and so on and so forth. And then when, but the same facilities, the facilities are provided, for example, that are in China, Shanghai, Beijing and um, not sure whether I should say Hong Kong, <laughs> you know, because, okay. uh, you know, uh, I mean, I'm saying that there are facilities provided for, you know, Hong Kong, Singaporeans in Hong Kong, Beijing and Shanghai, there are only 12 Singaporeans. Great, they have provided that facility. But why is it that 100,000 Singaporeans who are in, for example, in Malaysia, that these facilities are not provided? So there's a disproportionate... Uh, but then that's, uh, that's, okay, then that's on the policy side. No, there's unequal uh, treatment under the constitution as, as well, you uh, know what I mean? I'm not, I'm not too sure about that though. Uh, because the thing is, okay, we are talking about uh, whether or not uh, Singapore, Malaysians being stuck there in, in, in Malaysia, unable to return back to, to Singapore is, is an issue. It's like having their, uh, their right to vote being violated. You know what I mean? No, what and, I'm saying is that when yeah. you provide a facility which is so far yes. and a small population of 12,000 yeah. and you provide all the facilities yeah. in three cities in one country, when you have 100,000 locked down in a neighbouring country, when you don't provide them, there is unequal treatment of in, 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 under the constitution can also, it's also engaged. There's no equality as such. Okay. And there, of course, you need to show some reasons as to why. Yes. So these yeah. are things that all will form in a properly, in, if you have an elections commission, an independent elections commission, these are things that the elections commission can look into. But unfortunately, we don't have an independent elections commission. And um, the second point you asked, <laughs> can you just, I said I'll come to your first point and then I forgot the second point. No, the, the, the point is if the oh whether there's a, that the overseas voter can challenge. No, no, it's not whether can challenge. It definitely can challenge. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, point yeah, you. Yeah. But would that make a difference in this case? No, it won't. No meaning. No, it won't make a difference because the court has said yes. whether are there uh, essentially uh, do we have laws whereby yes. that there is a 
where we can locate in the Parliamentary Elections Act, for example, oh. that mandates that the government provide such facilities? No, I think from, from a very layman point yeah, of view, yeah, right? yeah. say, you know that this group of people are being stuck somewhere. Yeah. And yet, and during this period of time, knowing, knowing that this 200, 3,000, 100,000 cannot come back to vote, and you call the election. That's knowing that you're depriving them of their right. Because you could say, okay, let's wait until uh, a time when they can come back. But also the question mm. court yeah. asked me, I mean, how yeah. long? I mean, are you yeah. saying that uh, if the situation remains the same yeah. next year, are you, what will your response be? As in, As in if the situation of the pandemic remains the same yes. and they still face the lockdown and the restrictions, yes. how are we going to deal with this six months later or the, nine, nine months later, for example? Uh, I think during this period of time, okay. One thing, one fact that we could, uh, we should establish in, on this. I would say that some questions by the court and the AG is also quite reasonable. Oh, but no, we, yes, we yes, have yes, to have yes, the yes, yes, yes. balancing it's, exercise. It's yeah. actually very reasonable. Reasonable, yeah. It's very reasonable. But the thing is, we one fact we have to actually establish in Singapore yeah. is that laws and policies can be implemented overnight. So in in the case of uh, overseas voters not able to vote, how hard is it to implement, say, uh, postal voting? Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. This is where yeah. there is a solution, but there's also a problem yeah. in terms of the way the court, because, court found it. Mm. Because the court, the question that the court posed on this issue, okay, when, when will this pandemic end? Yeah, we, we don't know. It's, uh, it's uncertain. But the thing is, right, during this period of time, say if we put one year, for example, within one year, we could easily implement a policy to say we allow uh, so-called ballot voting. Yes. As, I mean, uh, so-called postal voting. Yes. And that would resolve the issue of that would voting, resolve yeah. the issue. It resolve the issue. Yes. Yeah, so no, no overseas voters will be prevented from yes, voting because yes. they are be able to vote vast uh, postal voting. Which is why we yeah. cited, for example, I'm not sure which minister cited in Singapore, the South Korean. Uh, I think Mr. Chan Chun Singh that the fact that South Korea, Korea is having the, the elections. Their you know, I mean, far a lot of countries, far no, greater number of countries have held uh, their elections in abeyance. But, but I think no, we have cited to the court. Yes. Let me just finish this point. Sure. Well, I'm saying that South Korea, about 26% of South Korean population, I mean, at least maybe about 20 something population, have this restriction, blah, 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 and they were allowed to exercise through ballot. Yeah. I mean, sorry, a postal, postal vote. vote. Postal vote. And therefore, and these results even uh, came before the final results. I mean, the, basically, they, they were able to exercise their vote even before the elections. Yeah. So, what I'm saying is that when you say South Korea, you just don't say South Korea. Yes. But what did South Korea do? Yes. They allowed postal vote. Yes. So there was free and fair elections. We are not saying don't hold the elections. Hold the elections as long as you take all the relevant measures that these elections are free and fair. Otherwise, it's not a constitutionally valid election. But correct me if I'm wrong, yeah. South Korea itself also have uh, uh, circumstances in we, why mm. it held an election because they are a fixed term. Yes, yes. The parliament yes, yes, system. Yes. It, it's not like in Singapore where it's like rubber band. Yeah. It could be a short four year, it could be a long five year. Yeah. So, it, uh, and as what uh, all of us, we understand is like the latest that the Singapore government could hold the next general election would be April next year. Yeah. So, they all this, talking, I mean, the overseas voters who, you know, who form a huge number, as in 200,000 is quite high. Yes. And, um, and the thing is that we have seen pass and all sorts of measures. I mean, I'm not sure, I'm not an expert in all this area, oh, no, no, but I what I'm saying, whether it's postal, <laughs> but some kind of overseas, uh, uh, ability for overseas voters to, to cast their vote, yeah. should technologically, or whether it's by postal, yeah. as in the traditional means of post, yes. could be resolved. And this is how others, like for example, South Korea have resolved. Yeah. We also highlighted that. So therefore, we are back to this quite question as to whether, on the question of the right to vote, yes. uh, the right of overseas voters, whether if they had taken out this application, there will be the second threshold that they have to cross, whether the government parliamentary elections uh, have, act, provide facilities. have provided yes is there a requirement now the your mm. next your the other issue about uh, whether uh, the, the question about policy you know how long how, how difficult it does it take for them to provide blah 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 and yes. so on and so forth the singapore courts have held a position that look they are not super legislature they their role is to basically um, uh, rule on the um, on, on, on the, the legal aspects. They are not there to actually super legislate, me meaning to define what policy. They should not be there to interfere in executive decision making as such. That is something that they, the Singapore courts have uh, taken a very strong position. Of course, uh, countries like in India, it is a bit more, uh, the, 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 the judiciary is more active. So, mm. you know, policies 
are you know concerned but when it comes to uh, you know uh, that the judiciary is uh, you know um, do take cognizance of unfair policies and they take it as a whole as to whether uh, it violates because the spirit of the constitution must be upheld at the end of the day it is not you know so yeah basically that okay so where the court have to do a balancing exercise like basically okay so given that the application has fall through uh, failed the High Court, failed the uh, Court of Appeal. Would you say that this application was, was worth it? Because I think a lot of commenters online would say that uh, it's it's uh, that why go through this? Because you, you show 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 lose what? Uh, why was that? Why 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 go through this unnecessary effort and then make the challenge? Since that uh, like a lot of people don't really have faith uh, in in certain things in Singapore. Yeah. Mm. I mean, the thing is that many people said the same thing when Velama did the challenge. Oh, true. true. Yes, mm. you know, or in Haugang, mm. the Court of Appeal ruled that the Prime Minister must hold an election mm. and based on that jurisprudence that we can rely on in a subsequent case and so on and so forth. So, um, and in this particular case, as I said, just three months before, the courts have, the High Court ruled that it is, the right to vote is not a fundamental right. Mm. When you say that, and where such rights are not expressed to be clearly constitutionally protected, there is, a, there is a threat to democracy and the constitutional supremacy of the Republic of Singapore basically to say uh, it, it's basically the, the, the constitutional, uh, um, the constitution is under threat, I will say that. When you say that you don't have a right to, the right to vote is not a fundamental right, three months, a uh, few months ago the court ruled in high court, then it is a threat to democracy because we are not clear what is our constitutional right. The I Court of Appeal in this case finally have clarified that, uh, of course people can say that, you know, oh, in the past the court has clarified here and there, but, you know, I've done quite a number of cases and uh, constitutional cases. The Court of Appeal has clearly said the right, in fact, I would quote paragraph 10 of the judgment, the right to vote is plainly a constitutional right. And so, in accordance with Article 4 of the Constitution, any law that is inconsistent with it would be open to challenge. This is a clear pronouncement by the Court of Appeal of Singapore that the right to vote is a constitutional right, that that right to vote cannot be abrogated by Parliament, in my understanding. And therefore, it's extremely important that when we are amidst these hustings, that this um, clarity has been, um, you know, this clarity uh, has been issued from the Court. Okay. The Court has clarified this uh, constitutional right. Yes, so therefore it, it is worth the challenge after all. I heard uh, that the AG actually said that the AGC, uh, Attorney General Chambers, yeah. actually uh, argued that the vote, uh, the right to vote, is a stat statutory right and not a constitutional right. Did they do that? You see, in the in 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 in, in um, John Tan's case, the AG took the position that John Tan did not have the right to stand for elections because John Tan's. He was prohibited from sending for elections because of his uh, the, the fine, the fine, yes. the fine of five thousand yes. dollars. So therefore, he did not have a right to stand for election. It's not a constitutional right. Mm. So therefore, it is not a constitutional right. Then it becomes just a statutory right. Yes. Yes. So that was the understanding we had that it is just a statutory right. That means under the Parliamentary Elections Act, is you just have a right to stand for elections. Where I argue, where I mean, I mean, I took the position that you cannot have. You cannot say that a right to stand for elections is actually a statutory right. The right to stand for election must be a constitutional right because right to vote. You can only, you must have a right to vote. Right to vote someone, right? So, and and so you have to have an elected representative. That person must be there. So the right to vote must, uh, uh, you know, encompass also the right to stand for election. It's also equally a constitutional right. So it was not clear as to whether the right to vote is a constitutional right because it got submerged on the question of right to stand for election, whether it's a constitutional right. This aspect was finally clarified by the court that the right to vote is a constitutional right. So have the costs for this uh, application been determined? Yeah, I mean, uh, basically the, <laughs> um, you know, constitutional applications, um, in most countries, they have uh, protective cost orders, which means citizens, um, ordinary citizens can challenge constitutional applications in uh, court. 
uh, have can file constitutional applications court without worrying too much about legal cost but unfortunately that is not the position in Singapore so the security of cost itself was twenty thousand dollars for my client to you know um, pay yeah, to, uh, to go on to the, the court of appeal. That means you know, I mean, when you were, the application was dismissed yeah. on 29th of Jul, uh, June, he was uh, the court high court ordered uh, eight thousand dollars plus some disbursements, filing fees and so on, and then the court of appeal court of appeal imposed uh, fifteen thousand dollars plus also disbursements is <laughs> a lot of money, and then uh, also um, there are filing fees that Costa has also paid, uh, you know. So basically. Um, yeah, we are looking at about $26,000 altogether. He settled with this legal cost and he has to pay this cost uh, soon. And um, also the thing is that uh, we have set up um, 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 a fundraiser, a fundraiser um, go get funding, um, appeal for donors. And I've done the matter pro bono uh, for this case because it is also my duty to assist um, you know, in this matter, and uh, because of the fact that it is uh, fundamental to the rights of citizens, and I, um, so he, we, 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 we have uh, set up this go get funding appeal. Hopefully, people will contribute to this fund, and then he'll be able to pay. As as the law, as the counsel for the client, the funding uh, so far is very low. Yeah, yeah, of, of course. <laughs> yeah. uh, but I think as, as the counsel for a lawyer, okay, yeah. Um, what we have to say, like, because this is a this is a public uh, appeal for public interest, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah public uh, appeal for public funding for this this constitutional challenge. So public interest, yeah. So how how would you convince like uh, why would people why should people donate? Well, people should donate because uh, this is a public interest litigation. Mm. It is not about Costa's personal right. Like mm. for example, he breached on contract or he owes some money or anything of that sort. Because his the, the, the constitutional challenge defines the right to voters, the right of overseas voters, right to vote, the, whether there's a question of free and fair elections in Singapore, whether it's constitutionally protected, whether there's actually a fundamental right to vote, and it's a constitutional right which is granted under the constitution. These are rights which affect all citizens. So therefore, everyone has a stake in it. So therefore, that, that um, is a fair ground for people to contribute positively. Okay. Um, oh, okay, my angle. Um, so uh, I think um, if there's any questions coming in from the uh, audience, uh, uh, we would, M. Ravi, I think, would be here happy to take the questions. Uh, no questions, right? Uh, is there? So, no questions. So, um, what, so, can we deviate a bit from the legal side? Okay. Okay, right? Uh, so, so what, what's your thought about like having the election at this point? Yeah. Um, I think that um, because you 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 you're, you're a former politician. <laughs> no lah, I don't think so. I can be qualified really. as yes. uh, I mean, uh, of course, I have respect for the word politicians yes. because it is a it is a virtuous uh, office. Yes. But what I'm saying is that um, um, I mean, I took part in the elections, you know, uh, before. But I'm I'm not a politician. Yes. Uh, I am a human rights lawyer. Um, I regardless of my political persuasion, whichever way, I am of the opinion that uh, under the circumstances, this election should not be held, given all these violations. And um, there should be, like what we have highlighted, um, election should be held later. Mm. But of course, there's also a question. What if all these measures are still in place as it still is a violation of free and fair elections. Where is, where is then, you know, I mean, there, there's this, I mean, where, where do we go? You see? And um, which is why, as I said, the importance of National Human Rights Commission, uh, human rights institution, like how they have in other countries mm -hmm. in Southeast Asia, the importance of an independent elections commission, besides the court, mm -hmm. you're turning to the court all the time. The importance of the court is immense. But at the same time, these other institutions, including ombudsman, are not in place, like in other countries. Uh, again, going yeah. back to the election, yeah, you yeah. mentioned earlier, before the nomination, uh, I think it was after the election was actually filed, you, you mentioned that, uh, that you won't be going to the politics and that uh, you would, 
you are actually doing what you can as a lawyer yes. instead of uh, partaking in, in politics. What, what's your thought about like normal citizen contributing to, to, to the uh, politic arena? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's a, it's a very good question because um, I was taking taxi this morning and then, you know, uh, just there's a, there's a small chat between the taxi driver and me. Oh, elections coming, you know. What's so great about elections, you know? I mean, I'm not interested in politics, you know. That was his reaction. So, but the thing is that no matter how, how much you're not interested in politics, politics is interested in you. Political decision making affects you. So that apathy, of course, you know, we know all that, uh, what happens at the end of the day, bridge tyranny and, and so on and so forth. So, average citizen should be interested you know that that politics political participation is not the domain of politicians it is the domain of every citizen it, we are all we are all social animals we are economic animals we are also political animals you know politics affects everyone so therefore it should be um, everyone should be interested in their own ways in whatever ways they can contribute like the taxi driver is also affected by the policies i suppose uh, like the taxi driver says that I'm, I'm not interested in politics. Yeah. But the policy in which how uh, private hires are allowed to pick up passengers, uh, how... But you see, the thing is that I understand because we are Singaporeans and we, I, I, I'm, I understand the psychology where it's coming from because he's so disenchanted, number one, that his voice, how much is, ah, yeah, no use, la, no matter, la, whatever it is, la, opposition will lose, la, and then PAP will 100% win, la, you know, and, you know, Bopian, la, you know, this is the, basically the language of um, that, you know, um, that, that, this is the language, la, that, uh, yeah. Oh, okay, so uh, we have a question from an overseas voter. Mm -hmm. So, say, say example, uh, the, the vote is 50-50. Uh, so, mm -hmm. so you're like 1,000 votes against 1,000, and that, and, and that, and that circumstances, the overseas votes would actually have mattered. Mm -hmm. Not just the spoil vote, but overseas vote. And in that circumstances, can we challenge the result? Mm, you see, the thing is that uh, Section 90 of the Parliamentary Elections Act is a specific, it's a specific section that gives you the right, gives a voter the right to set aside the elections. But it is very specific, like bribery, you know, and undue influence, blah 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 blah, and, you know, and so on and so forth. You know, I'm not sure whether gerrymandering is inside there, oh, but it's not there. Yeah. So these are basically the uh, very specific category. Um, the, the, the question is, the question is, at the end of the day, it will go back to the right to vote. And whether you were denied this first, the, the, whether, you were, whether you were denied your right to vote. Oh. And the discussion that we had before. Yes, yes. So it will be back to that same old discussion. Because whether the government has a duty to provide Facilities. Facilities. Where, and where, where the parliamentary elections Where there's a transport, where there's a balloting, oh, oh, sorry, uh, postal, postal voting. Yes, is it under the Parliamentary Elections Act, whether is it constitutionally impermissible for the government to deny that? Uh, is it, uh, basically, yeah. whether if, uh, if you don't provide, uh, for example, the facilities in the current circumstances, where does it say in the Parliamentary Elections Act that that will violate the law and that they must be provided. So the courts are asking this question, where is it? But my response to this is that if they don't provide, it is, I don't have to actually locate a specific section. Or the fact that par Parliament does not provide that itself is a violation of the right to vote. I think the... the uh, That's what, my response. One is actually pretty unacceptable or un, un, uh, that is creating a lot of doubt within the, the overseas voters is that it's like apparently this is the government's decision yes. to call for election, keeping them out from this whole process. Yes. And in a way, yes, while it may be legal, but, but it looks so wrong. It is so wrong that, that they want to be part of this whole process. But, but by calling it polling an election at this point, where they are stuck overseas and they are helpless to come back, uh, like, isn't that like morally wrong in a certain way? I mean, the thing is that um, the courts are not so much concerned about morality as yeah. such. Mm. Yeah, the courts are concerned about what the is le legality. Okay. Some things may be, you know, I don't venture to that, you know, yeah, for example, yeah, yeah. 377, yeah, 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 you know. Yeah. But what I'm saying is that uh, the, thing, the thing is that at the end of the day, um, 
we don't have to even look at the moral point of view. There are enough jurisprudence, enough legal concepts around the world to say that free and fair elections encompasses uh, the notion that um, the right to vote is, uh, I mean, that, that, I mean, basically uh, the right to vote encompasses free and fair elections and such practices, denial of such practices will be a violation. Whether it's under international law, or whether it's even ASEAN parliamentarians have issued statements that the Singapore, that the current pandemic elections violate free and fair elections. We don't have to go to the Western world or whatever. ASEAN itself has some kind of a consensus on that. But I highlighted all this to the court. They said that, oh, you know, they are issuing some statements here and there, but the courts are concerned about, you know, where is the Pali Pali, where, <laughs> show me where the act is. So, so, end of the day, uh, the only way to, in, uh, to affect change on this this thing, whether is it postal voting, whether is it ensure, uh, for the government to ensure that there are, there are sufficient or, 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 or facility present for overseas voters to vote, would have to come to, from the parliamentarians. And, and for it to change, you have to actually change. Change the government. I mean, to, to, to be very plain, mm. let me just tell you the genesis, genesis of this, genesis in the history of this thing about even this right to vote, right? Mm. Ms. Theolien, a, a constitutional professor, in, in 2001 or 2000, that period of time, she raised this question to the, in parliament when she was a nominated MP that the government should state very clearly the right to vote is a constitutional right or a fundamental right. They should, they should state that. Then in response to that, because this became part of our discussion in the court as well, that in response to the law minister and Mr. Wong Kan Singh said that it's an implied right under the constitution because the right to vote is such so fundamental to the functioning of the representative democracy. So all this sounds like it's a fundamental right and so mm -hmm. on and so forth. But until now, we are not even defining it as a con fundamental right. The courts have not said that. And then they're saying that yes, it's a constitutional right. So we need to have a new generation of Singaporeans. The constitutional is really badly drafted. We have not specifically stated our rights very clearly. And we are depending on courts. And courts, of course, to a, to a certain extent, they have also done, uh, I mean, I, I will say that under a lot of constraints in the local context in Singapore, the jurisprudence, the courts also have made progressive judgments, you know. But there's only, there, and hence that, that, that in the absence of parliamentary ombudsman, National Human Rights Commission, Independent Elections Commission, we have to rely too much on the court. Whereas these other mechanisms are available in countries like in Malaysia and Indonesia and also in Myanmar for that matter. There's a question from the uh, viewer. Uh, Ong Ye Kun uploaded a video of him with a primary school kid that basically uh, is in violation of the, uh, the election uh, right, rules, regulations. So what's your take on it? Uh, do you think that this violation uh, is serious enough to disqualify him as a candidate? You're talking so serious. No, I, I don't get, get that question. Ah, so so uh, I think you might not be aware. Mm -hmm. Ong Ye Kun actually recently uploaded a video uh, which is clearly a political uh, video and inside the video there's uh, kids inside and, and under the uh, election campaigning regulation you're not supposed to actually do that mm, well if he's I, I, I suppose mm. on uh, I think uh, uh, I think the thing here is that attorney general has to take action first yes exactly correct yes because uh, I, I do recall uh, in general election 2015 yeah. uh, where in Nishun GRC where mm -hmm. the uh, Minister of Home Affairs and, okay former Minister of Home Affairs and, and Law K. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the and his team uh, there, there was certain uh, posters that mm -hmm. was at the one of the market right. and was we, it was sounded us to us that some of the posters did not have the stamp and under the, the uh, again under the regulations your, all the posters that are displayed must have the stamp Okay, the, the purpose of the stamp was simply to ensure that uh, the candidates do not overpace the, the posters because there's a limitation of how much posters can you put up uh, per, as in, in one ward SMC or in a GRC. So, so eventually, there were two police reports. Okay, at the end, there was two police reports, but during the election, there was one police report found. But till today, there was no, nothing heard of it. <laughs> so, so uh, it's just like, ah, uh, and, and we, if we go even back further, remember the Chengshan CC, uh, CC mm, incident mm. Where, where the... Uh, uh, 200 meters. Yeah, the 200 mm. meter thing. So, the court ruled, of course. Yeah. Uh, no, but the, no. Yeah. That's, or the AG, yeah. Yes, you see, yeah. a lot of people have this misunderstanding that it was the court that Actually, ruled that. Actually, it's not, it's not. Yeah, right. it was not. It yeah, was yeah, the yeah, attorney yeah. general who, 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 who took, the position, took yeah. the position that that was, that was not a violation. 
because the person was already inside. And and that I think that's the problem here. It's like the 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 uh, incumbent, mm. uh, the PA or PAP, uh, can can violate a, a number of uh, of uh, regulations uh, that has been set up. Mm. But the 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 fact that the attorney general, if they take a position that that they would not prosecute such violation, they basically are immune to the rules that they are they have set up. While at the same time. Uh, if the uh, alternative parties, any candidate were to actually violate that rules, immediately uh, Attorney General would jump in and then mm. prosecute the person. You see, the problem yeah. in Singapore is yeah. that we are wearing several conflicting hats. And if we don't come to fundamentals, we found won't find a solution. Of course, I'll come back to this question first before the... Yeah. <laughs> because basically this uh, issue is that we have to define... Because I don't have enough... Uh, I've been following... I think maybe I've been too engrossed in my cases. Yes. That uh, usually I'll be, I'll be updated on these things. But the thing is that whether he, he has breached any election rules, you know, election regulations, mm -hmm. or whether he has committed a crime under the... Uh, the pandemic, I mean the, the PESCA. No, I don't, I don't think so. I don't think it's, it's, under, not, yeah. it's not neither of any of that. If he, has not, if, if he has not breached election rules, then you can't take out. Oh, the, it's, uh, it's, it's uh, on the appearance of kids. If I'm not wrong, SDP got that once. Uh, they had kids line up. Uh, uh, oh, no, sorry. It was, if I'm not wrong, it was Corbyn 1, if I, okay. I don't recall. So, yes. okay. If, you know, um, mm. as I said that, you know, I, I, this is not to be taken as a legal advice, yes, but yes, based yes. on, I'm trying to digest the issues yeah. and find, find a legal foundation. If the issues are that, uh, if, the, if the, it's in breach, if this photograph yes. is in breach of the election department rules, particular yes. regulations, then it violates the election rules and therefore it that that he, the results can be uh, this happened before nomination or after but but the, but the thing is this incident happened before nomination or after after right. after nomination yeah. okay so therefore this written. section yeah. yeah so one can just i mean yeah. perhaps uh, but, but i think it goes back to the the point i was making just now one i have to carefully look at parliamentary elections act section 19 for, ex yeah. for no, example but, but, yeah, but see, to set aside the results if they are in breach of the parliamentary election acts and the rules no but the end of the day yeah. if the attorney general does not take no, action no 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 huh? no 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 there are two things here yes the two things here attorney general yes. if it's a criminal if it's if it's a criminal act, yes. Attorney General steps in. Yes, you know that's basically uh, you know if it's okay. Okay, oh, okay. Sorry, let me revise. If ELD doesn't take action, if ELD doesn't take action, yeah. then it is open to the candidate uh, in that constituency to complain. To, no, no, no. Hold on. Uh, to challenge it under the Parliamentary Elections Act by way of an election petition uh, after the result. That's one way. Would that work? Uh, I mean, the thing is that Parliamentary Elections Act, yes. um, as I said, I have to look uh. at to the specific Parliamentary Elections, um, basically Section 90, right, has certain grounds, you know, uh, if it is not in compliance with one of the grounds, I think that this could be one of those grounds, could be, I'm just saying, I have to look at it, then if it does fall that, then it's open to the candidate in that constituency to set aside that, that result. Because you, have, you can have an election petition, you know. No, but let's say if ELD does not choose to not pursue. No, no, no. Uh, ELD doesn't. Yeah. The courts at the end of the ah, day. I see. Yeah, the, the, ah. you see, the thing is that ELD don't take action. Yes. You are right. I, I think that, that this is where the confusion lies. Yes. ELD has to be advised by the PM Attorney General. Oh. PMS office okay. is one issue. Yes. But where does the PMO is not the lawyer for the ELD? Yeah, I know there is still it has to, to, yeah, the I mean, general. PMO yes. cannot yeah. give advice, legal advice. So right. the state has to give advice. So therefore, the Attorney General has to give advice. So this is where there's also a problem, you see, where if you have an Attorney General who advises the government, at the same time, the Attorney General is also is a public prosecutor. There is a conflict. I mean, for the former Attorney General, Mr. Walter Woon have raised this kind of conflict issues as, as well and so on and so forth. So we have to come back to first principle on this. If we need solutions, we need to have... We cannot be wearing several hats, I'm saying, that we need to have several institutions to check on this. This is where a few things are conflated, so it's difficult. But on this issue, there can be still an election petition presented if it is in violation of the election rules. The courts are the ultimate arbiter on this issue. Mm -hmm. So, um, Sebastian, maybe we can open up the...
the link. Okay, scroll down. Yeah, elections violate. Uh -huh. Okay, Parliamentary Elections Act prohibits primary and secondary school students from taking part in election activities yeah. um, between nomination day and polling day. So, this happened yeah. after nomination day or on of it. The means it was posted after the nomination day. Posted, yes. but action happened before. While this prohibition does not apply outside of this period, yes. Uh, does not apply outside of these see, periods. I Political see. parties should refrain. Ah. Yeah, so you know, it's, it's not like clear offense. It's, it's it? not. Ah. It's not clear. I see. It's not clear. But in any case, if one feels very strongly about this, one can still take that an action if it is under the parliamentary, if it's a breach under the Parliamentary Elections Act. Okay, so going back to it, it ends ends up. Uh, okay, sorry. On this right. If one were to take out a parliamentary petition, would that cost cost them? One has to deposit. From what I, I recall, is like there was once I was uh, representing uh, Chi Seok Chin in SDP's case. In I'm not sure. I think it's a 2006 elections or 2011 elections. I can't remember where I took out an application for fi to file an application on to set aside that particular result on certain grounds, the election results. So there was, you know, I think there was an issue of security of deposit of five thousand dollars. I think it's there. That you need to pay first of all security deposit. I think it's five thousand. It might have changed now. Um, and then, of course, you have to engage lawyers and you have to argue. Not that you must engage. You can argue on your own, but you need to have uh, an someone who's expert as well in this area. What, what's the chance of you saying that it will happen? A person taking up this? I mean, uh, the mm -hmm. thing is that I can't speculate. Oh, okay. Yeah. Possibility. <sighs> okay, how, how um, I think it's more of how reluctant would one. Yes, yes. How to, reluctant? Well, yeah. if one is so reluctant to donate to this go get yeah. go what is that? Um, go go fund. No, no, yeah. go go fund. <laughs> go, go get fund, funding. Go, go get funding. Because I've yeah. never really take, taken up so much of funding uh, yeah. activity. I mean, as in like you know, participate in funding activities yes. because so far my work has been pro bono essentially. But this part of it. So, yeah, I mean, like, it all depends on how seriously people take their rights. Seriously. Oh, okay. How seriously people take their, yeah. Uh, Sebastian, is there any question? No, no more questions. Uh, okay. So, uh, M. Ravi, do you have any parting words for the viewers? Well, um, I think particularly on the election right, constitutional rights, etc. Mm. Yes, I think that it is very, very important that people take constitutional rights very seriously because it affects us in, in many ways, like for example, as basic as the right to vote, like the overseas voters. And I think that it is important that we have a, have a government which is in place, which takes this right seriously, and Singaporeans should, um, um, should look into uh, a new Singapore, which has clear constitutional safeguards for us to move forward. Hey, hey, before we, we, yeah. we end, the, end the show, yeah. can we ask, right, since there are a lot of overseas Singaporeans being affected, right, can yeah. they all pull together and file one, or, uh, one application? Uh, yeah. <laughs> no such thing, is it? Of course, they, I mean, uh, the, the, the thing is that, as I said, I can't give legal advice uh, like this, but uh, what I'm saying is that at the same time, uh, there were so Singaporeans who have been approaching and stuff like that. Well, see, because the, the yeah, I've posted some, some even on my Facebook post yeah, about Singaporeans be, be, complaining. Uh, no, yeah. because the thing is, right, yeah. I think for a lot of, a lot of uh, people, you know, to have your name being soloed out there and say this person is following them, it just takes a lot of courage. It takes a lot of uh, courage, it takes a lot of uh, commitment. Uh, but if we were actually launching a certain action yeah. uh, as a collective group, yeah. uh, that's a different thing. Yeah. So uh, is there any... Uh, uh, I'm saying that basically, as I said, yes. nothing stops any group of Singaporeans coming together and expeditiously launching a challenge on 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 a, uh, on, on their denial of the right to vote, ah. and whether the court whether this matter can be revisited from another aspect that is subject to one's uh, you know legal research and so on and so forth. But you know, there's only so much of time left, and these things cannot be like. Delayed, and you also cannot follow the courts. Also, you know, I mean, they last simply, you know, I mean, like nomination day. Yes, please. No nomination day. Yes. I mean, this particular uh, case was going on, and then there's, you know, there was a decision here, and then now we have about less than um, ten. I mean, we have about um, 
nine days. Mm. Yeah. So nine days. How long we have? Uh? Wait, from next, from next, now? Next, yeah, next Friday. Oh, no, it's ten, ten, ten. Ten we, days. We, yeah, we. Uh, no, no. <laughs> no, no. How many days we have to vote? No. Huh? Ne- next, next, uh, next, next Friday, Friday is election. Yes. Okay. So I know you and I we are so tired. Three We're days. So <laughs> another seven days. Seven yeah. days. Yeah. yeah. So what I'm saying is that yeah, there's so 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 few days left as well. I mean, like you know. Still, nothing stops people from filing and coming together and so on and so forth. But we must also understand the decision of the court as well, what I have just articulated. And at the same time, it is also open to Singaporeans to file a complaint to the UN reporter on free and fair elections. Special reporter on free and fair elections. Every citizen should not give up their right just like that. They can also alternatively file a complaint to the UN reporter, special reporter on free and fair elections, and that complaint will be raised with the Singapore government. But again, the, given the time limit, I wouldn't be so optimistic whether the UN can intervene so fast. And you know, it's it's difficult. But it there are ways where you can actually take steps to fight for your rights. Uh, I. Uh, Mr. Ravi, could you help to explain this, uh, answer this question? Um, so Chun Cheng actually say that he uh, would like you to understand more on the section 5 bracket 2A of the constitution. It appears that there was once a requirement for referendum, uh, two thirds of majority, uh, to be held if certain parts of the constitution were amended. Do you know the story behind this paragraph and it was ever on force? Uh, Apparently, that, that's the case now, isn't it? You, you need to have two-third majority if you want to amend the constitution. You see, two-third majority, yes, to amend the constitution, yes, yeah, it stands. I mean, for example, the ISA cases and all that, they amended the constitution. Singapore Was it the same? Yeah, Singapore has amended the constitution like changing underwear. What? We all yeah. know that even the former Attorney General have said that, Mr. Walter Woon, you know, out of all persons, you know? Yes. I mean, like he has said that we have amended the constitution like nobody's business. 50 over time, sir? I don't know. Countless times until I also lost count, you know. So what I'm saying is that, um, the thing is that for in America, 250 years, very few occasions they have amended the constitution. So leaving this aside, this, this question raises a more important issue. Can parliament with the th- two-third majority say it's a constitutional right, it's a constitutional amendment, right? Can they take away the right to vote? Parliament, the court has defined this constitutional right. Court of Appeal said, Right towards the constitutional right, right? Actually, that's a good, very good question yes. to end this session. That uh, was my anxiety. Uh, yes. Uh, frankly, is it impossible for a, a, a parliament being voted in to, to basically amend the constitution in such a way that uh, certain individuals of a certain class cannot vote? or to bar certain individuals from standing for election. Yes, in that instance, that is what the Court of Appeal is saying, that you can then file an application under the, that, that constitution is the supreme law of the land, so therefore any acts or legislation passed, the court can intervene, right? So that is where the court can intervene because a constitutional right cannot be question is taken away right. or amended. This is, can be amended. That's why right to vote is different from other right. See, constitution itself, right? It has fundamental rights which cannot be taken away. There are constitutional rights which can be amended like three-quarter, two-third. But, but I, 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 need, uh, I don't want to end with this uh, yeah. question in my mind. But am I wrong to say that freedom of assembly is also a constitutional right? Yeah, but, but subject but, to restrictions. Particularly, only particular on the freedom of assembly and freedom of us. no freedom of freedom of uh, freedom of expression encompasses freedom of assembly, freedom of uh, association, and uh, you know, and free speech, right? So basically, I mean, this whole notion of freedom of the, no, this whole notion of freedom of expression, which is in Article Fourteen, there are it's not absolute. There are subject to restrictions like defamation, contempt of court, blah, 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 blah. These rights can be restricted. So, and, pali- and social order, and so on and so forth. I mean, public order. So, these um, are the permissible, permissible restrictions. Ah. Right? Same thing. For right to vote, can you... Import certain causes. Clauses yeah. to deny certain people. That is where it becomes even... I mean, if it's a fundamental right, parliament 
the, 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 the limit, there are so many limits for them how they can limit your right to vote. Basically, that is where the court can intervene because it's the supreme law of the land. You can't simply pass a legislation and take away that right. Yeah. Can. Actually, so, yeah. so, so basically it can be confusing. Towards the end, we should lend some clarity. Yeah. The fact that the Court of Appeal has ruled that yeah. right to vote is a constitutional right in the, in, in, against what, whatever has transpired in the judgment, it appears that Parliament cannot take away that right. Whether you call it a fundamental right, whether you call it a constitutional right, to me, it is at the end of the day, the judgment says that it is a constitutional right. Parliament cannot take away that right because it is, is, it is, it is, it is interpreted as a within the supremacy clause of the constitution that constitution is supreme that means right to vote is a fundamental right to vote is a constitutional right that parliament cannot take away from therefore citizens. this application was worthy therefore this application was worthy great uh, thank you everyone for sharing <laughs> thank you everyone for for being here with us and i hope you all enjoy the discussion uh, uh, PJ had to go go and do something else, so therefore I'm standing in. Uh, frankly, you wouldn't see me here by, right? <laughs> if PJ was free. So, uh, once again, thanks for a lot of time. Uh, we will be ending here. Hope to see you soon tomorrow. Mm.